the Weissman Heat Show, presenting a variety of entertainment, celebrating tonight the beginning of Rudy Valley's fifth year in command of this broadcast. <laughs> time, ladies and gentlemen, has been your time at this hour for the past four years. Tonight, the sponsors of this program honor Rudy with a special anniversary broadcast. Our company, numbering more than 75 people, includes representative spokesmen from every branch of the entertainment world. Representing Broadway and Hollywood. Walter Winchell, who will introduce Lou Holtz and company. Representing the legitimate theater. Haywood Broom, who will introduce a scene from the Pulitzer Prize play, The Green Pasture with the Hall Johnson Choir. Representing the concert stage, Dean Taylor, who will introduce Felix Salmon, one of the world's finest cellists. Representing the creators of modern popular music, George Gershwin, who will introduce a medley of hit tunes associated with Rudy Valley. The Connecticut Yankees, augmented for the occasion, and assisted by a vocal ensemble, open the celebration with an Elliot Jacoby arrangement of early Valley hits. The title, Overture 1929.
what you may, whatever you say, you know that I'll always love you this way. I love you, I love you, I love you. You are my sweetheart. Representing Broadway from Times Square to Columbus Circle and all joints east and west. The country's correspondent at the crossroads of the world, Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Border to Border and Coast to Coast. This is your New York correspondent, Mrs. Winchell's Walter. They have given me two very pleasant assignments tonight. One is to convey to our host, Mr. Hubert Shire Valley, the affectionate regards of Broadway, and to introduce to you again another favorite son of Times Square, Mr. Lou Holt. I know that Mr. Valley must be chuckling a little, because here he is beginning his fifth year as a star on the network, and when he began, I was among his hecklers, his very first. It was a lot of fun, ladies and gentlemen, trying to make him mad, but he wound up making me mad because he refused to be bothered. He just wouldn't bend Bernie me, but took all that the wise crackers gave him until we got tired of wasting all that time. And now there he is grinning, I'll bet, as he watches me feeding the microphone some sugary wordage about his success. It isn't the first time I've helped him fill a scrapbook. A few Sunday nights ago on my own network, I told you how he had returned to the Broadway sector and registered a remarkable hit. I didn't know at the time when I was seeing his phrases that way that he was listening with the earphones from a sick bed in a hospital. And so here's to you, Rudy, and to your grand success on the most fickle of the boulevard. This is proof enough to me that you're a big time. You certainly can take it, mister, and I salute your courage. When I heard that Lou Holtz was going to be with us tonight, I asked Lou to do for you one of his famous palace theater sketches. Just a minute. Just a minute. Flat. Lou Holt, celebrated fugitive from a chain gag, is being honored tonight by a monster banquet of the local chapter, Ipsy Pipsy Lot. When last seen, Holt, accompanied by Sawalski, his shadow, was headed this way in a taxi cab. Here he comes now in a cloud of dust. Enter Holt, Sawalski, and taxi cab. Mr. Chairman, 
As a token of esteem, the Itchy Pitchy Lodge presents you with a watch donated by Brother Greenberg. Here it is. Hooray! My friend, I want to thank you for this beautiful token. President Holt, you ought to read the members the inscription on the back cover of the watch. The inscription? Yeah. To our, it's a pleasure. I'll read the inscription on the back of the watch. It says here to Lou Holt from Max Greenberg and Son, highest class jewelers to the elite. 1759 Elf Street, telephone orchard 69705, old jewelry, box and soul. Option sale every Tuesday and Friday, ladies invited. It's a beautiful sentiment, Brother Greenberg. And I know you mean every word from your heart. Allow me to give you this ring as a token of my everlasting appreciation. This ring, my friend, is the only ring of its kind in the world. It's a heirloom, as we call it on the other side. A heirloom that's been in my family for generations and generations. And I'm giving it to you as a remembrance. I thank you, Brother Hope. But there's an old custom that when you receive a gift, you should give a coin for good luck. Here's a quarter. I don't like to take the money, my friend, but I'll take the quarter for luck. Gee, Holt, it's too bad it's the only ring of its kind in the world because I'd love to have one like that. Really? Here, I'll let you have five more for 35 cents. Okay. Can I have the floor? Do I see you, John? Members of UC City Lodge, at every annual banquet, the president always speaks on the subject that is most important to the members. Yeah. 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 I'm here to speak on a subject of the people, for the people, and by the people. In other words, inflation. <laughs> inflation is a thing that has everybody in the dark. Mr. President, I'd like to take the floor. So I'll see your giant. I think the lodge ought to have a new chandelier. I think it's ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous for the lodge to have a chandelier? Who's going to play it? And now, my friends, to get back to the subject that is nearest and dearest to me, inflation. The word inflation is derived from the Latin. In is in. Play is to hit. Sun is from sun in the sky. So, if you go up high enough to hit into the sun, that's inflation. Mr. Holmes. Yeah? I'd like to get paid for the banquet. Who's speaking to this Skyline? The head waiter. Who gave you the floor? I'm talking about inflation. That's all very interesting, but who's paying for these mighty dinners? My friend, now don't worry. Reply to your last question. I am now in communication with the brain trust in Washington. Word has reached my ear. I repeat, who is paying $180 for these dinners? Reply to your last remark. I make a move that this meeting adjourns. Before the meeting adjourns, what do you do about the $180? In reply to that last question, my friend, word has reached my ear from London. That Ramsey McDonald will straighten now the whole situation. I don't care about that. I want my money. Listen, my good man, will you take an IOU from Mr. Lou Holtz, the president? All right. Well, hand me a piece of paper and pencil. Here, I'll write you an IOU. I owe you one hundred and eighty dollars. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. I want you to sign it. That's fine. Now, hand me back the IOU to be the kindly, and we'll consider the whole matter settled. Oh, thank you. You're more than welcome, my friend. My dear Smith people, I have here... Just a moment, President Holt. Brother Garfinkel has been laid up in the hospital since last week. He's been a member of our lodge for 20 years, and he's one member who always paid his dues. And to show our appreciation, I propose that we give him something. You're absolutely right, Swarovski. Let's give Brother Garfinkel three cheers. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Looking over the silverware, we find a dozen spoons missing. Missing a dozen spoons? Yes, sir. I should place my receipt case on. My friends, word has reached my ears that we are missing not more, not less than 12 spoons, and we're only down to the fourth floor. I know that the ceiling is curious. I know that the ceiling is absolutely accidental. I can feel deep down in my heart that the man who stole the spoons would give anything if he could give them back to nobody should know. It's the luckiest thing in the world for him that Lou Holt is the president of the Easter Pitchy Lodge because I have figured out a way that he can give back the spoons and save me the trouble of having to undress every member of the lodge. In plain words, here's my team. The last will turn out the lights. I'll count one, two, three, four, five slowly. And the guilty father will put the spoons back on this table. 
It'll be dark, so nobody will be the wiser. So I'll see how you're ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want the lights out. The lights are out. Yeah. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Up with the light. My God, who stole the table? Paul Whiteman, who began the vogue of having a girl sing on the band for the lighter type of popular song, the blues and the hot shot type. People say that Alice Faye sings each succeeding song better than the last one. Tonight she does. You've got everything. a celebrated composer and critic. He is best known, perhaps, for his looking glass scene, and for two successful American operas, The King's Henchman and Peter Ibbotson. Mr. Dean Taylor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wallington. You know, if it hadn't been for Rudy Valet, there probably wouldn't be any crooners. I don't know that we ought to be too grateful to him for having created them. But on the other hand, when we do say what we do about pruners, we're talking not about Mr. Valet, but about his 67,000 imitators. He seem to have grasped everything about his particular method of singing except the qualities that make it good. Now, if I had the time, I could uh, bore you pretty thoroughly with uh, an analysis of the use of mezzo voce and tempo rubato that distinguishes Mr. Valet's vocalism. Fortunately, I have not. I can only say that I've heard singers with more powerful voices and singers with, more, with a more pretentious repertoire. But I have yet to hear a singer who accomplishes what he sets out to do with more taste and skill than does Rudy Valet. During the past year or so, he has appeared on these programs not only as a singer, but as an impresario. In that capacity, he has accomplished the extraordinary feat of successfully introducing into a popular program a number of serious musical artists, concert and opera singers and instrumental virtuosos. It is one of these, Felix Thomas, the distinguished cellist whom it is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight. I still remember Mr. Thomas' first New York recital upwards of 10 years ago and what an exciting event it was. He was a famous artist when he came to us from England then, and he remains today one of the three or four living masters of the cello who deserved the adjective great. His offering tonight is an arrangement by uh, Elliot Jacoby for cello and orchestra of one of the loveliest folk songs in the world, the old Irish tune known as the Londonderry Air. Many of you know it already, but whether you do or not, after tonight you can say that you have heard it played by a great artist, Felix Thomas.
past four years, we have been telling you about the health value of flights and heat. During that time, millions of Americans have heard, heeded, and benefited by our advice. Let us sum up for you now the simple facts about Fleischmann's fresh yeast as a health food. A very large proportion of the headaches, skin troubles, and general loss of vitality suffered today are caused by poisonous waste of which the body does not rid itself. Fleischmann's yeast corrects many of these ills by helping you to remove the poisonous accumulations that are responsible for this condition. It strengthens the intestinal muscles. Therefore, it does not form a habit. Fleischmann's fresh yeast irradiated is rich in three important health-giving, body-building vitamins. It has a real tonic effect. These facts are proven by the experience and backed by the advice of hundreds of celebrated physicians to rid your body of accumulated poisons, to prevent headaches and indigestion, to relieve common skin disorders, to keep yourself always looking and feeling your best. These famous doctors recommend three cakes of Fleischmann's fresh yeast daily. W.E.A.F. New York. You are listening to the Fleischmann Geek Show, a special anniversary program celebrating the beginning of our fifth year with Rudy Valley. We have a telegram from the president of the company sponsoring this broadcast. It reads, Mr. Rudy Valley, Times Square Broadcasting Studio. Congratulations on this, the fourth anniversary of the Fleischmann Hour, which has contributed to my enjoyment as well as to that of our audience. Now, your rendition of the program has made it nationally popular. Good wishes for the continued success of the Fleischmann Hour and our very pleasant association. Signed, Joseph Wilka, President, Standard Brands Incorporated. Our guests tonight include Dean Taylor, Felix Salmon, Haywood Broon, the Hall Johnson Choir, Walter Winchell, George Gershwin, and Lou Holt. We continue our review of our German song hits, some of them introduced by Rudy Valley. Our singing cast includes Ruth Gordon, Darrell Woodyard, Ruth Rodehaver Thomas, the Gearsdorf Sisters, and the Internet. As official representative of the legitimate theater on tonight's anniversary program, we have selected a reformed dramatic critic and sports writer who is also an ex-producer of musical shows, or rather, a musical show, a musical show, a musical show. He once ran for Congress, he has written two novels, and he paints a mean sunset. Incidentally, he is a great newspaper. His name, Haywood Bruce. And also a notary public. I know that's an old gag, ladies and gentlemen, but it seems to me I have heard old gags on this program before. I've also heard on this program the work of the most competent playwrights and the finest American actors and actresses, and that, I think, has been Mr. Valley's most important contribution to the art, the science, the the business, or whatever you want to call it, a broadcast. Even more rare than a new joke on the air, rare than a dramatic writing and a brilliant dramatic performance. I think that radio drama right now is in its infancy, or even a little younger. It's in the same state as the motion pictures. Back in the days when Pearl White was queen of the screen, and the perils of Pauline were considered way uptown. The day will come when you'll be able to hear full-length plays on the air, written by the best playwrights and acted by the best talent the theater has to offer. I'll give you the profit of that day, Mr. Rudy Valley. An excellent example of the quality of the dramatic material Rudy has brought you 
is the scene you are going to hear tonight. The scene is from the Pulitzer Prize play, The Green Pastures, by my friend Mark, by my friend Mark Hunt. The play, as you know, has been a triumphant success, both artistically and financially. It brought Mark Conley back to the poker game for the great delight and profit of all his friends. And it, it really takes a very successful play to enable Mark Conley to go in on the poker game. As you know, the Green Pastures is a dramatic version of the Old Testament narrative that might be pictured in the simple imagination of a devout southern Negro. With impressive, reverent, Disarming simplicity, Mark Conley has translated into terms of the theater the same religious yearning, the same steadfast, reverent, disarming simplicity. Mark Conley has translated into terms of the theater the same religious yearning, the same steadfast faith that find a kindred expression in the Negro spirit. When is the wars in Egypt land that mighty all war? Oppressed so hard they could not stand that mighty all Fast as you 
I know, but the Lord said I'd do it. He said I was to show the promised land to you all. Forty years I've been leading. I led you out of Egypt. I led you past Sinai and through the wilderness. Oh, I can't fall down on you now. But let's rest here for the night. Then we'll see how you feel in the morning. You told the scouts you'd meet them three miles further on. I hate for them to come back all this way to Repo. The sun is gone down, ain't it? The sun ain't gone down yet. No? Then it's mine. No, maybe it's the dust. No, I, I just can't seem to see. Oh, Lord, they can't have a blind man leading them. Way, Galen. Do you think, do you think it's the time he said? How do you mean? He said I could lead him to the Jordan and that I'd see the promised land. And that's all the further I could go. On account I broke the law. A little while back, I thought I did see a river here. And a pretty land on the other side. Where's the young leader of the truth? Where's Joshua? Yes, sir. What's the shouting about, Joshua? The scout is back with the news. The Jordan is right ahead of us, and Jericho is just on the other side. Moses, we're there. Uh, oh, it's the River Jordan. Yes, sir. All we got to take is the city of Jericho. Joshua, you got to take charge of the fighting men, and here in got to stay by the priest. What about you? You're leaving me behind. Joshua, you're going to get the fighting men together and take that city before sundown. It's a big city, Moses, with walls all around it. We ain't got enough men. You'll take it, Joshua. Yes, sir. Now, move up to the walls with our people. Tell the priest to go with you with the ram's horn. You start marching around them walls. And then, and then, yes, sir. Oh, well, the Lord, he'll take charge. Just as he took charge every time I led you against the city. He ain't never failed us yet, is he? No, no. And he ain't gonna fail us now, children. Oh, Lord. I'm sending over our brave young men to you. Because I know you don't want me to lead them any further, Lord. Just like you said, I got to the Jordan. I can't get over. Yes. And now the coast of the city of Jericho, Lord. In a little while, they'll be marching around. And would you please be so good as to tell them what to do? Amen. Go oh, ahead. Everybody follows Joshua now. Give the signal to move on with everything. We camp for the night in the city of Jericho. Can we help you, Brother Moses? No, you go ahead. Lord's got his plans for me. Down the signal to march. But, Lord, please don't forget about Joshua and the fighting men. They're marching on to Jericho, Lord. I told them to march around the walls, and then the Lord would tell them just what to do. Is, is you over there helping them, Lord? Is you going to tell them poor children what to do? Is you, Lord? Good 
Did it all. You took him. Listen to the children's sing. He's in the land of Canaan at last. Oh, Lord. You're the only God there ever was. Thank you, Lord. October 27th is Navy Day. Naval men everywhere are tuned in on tonight's broadcast. The official Navy magazine each year has asked us to dedicate a number on medley to Navy Day. And as the next job, I dedicate to my buddies everywhere their favorite song, Anchors Away. introduce Dr. R. E. Lee, whose one-minute talks are a regular feature of this hour. For over 15 years, Dr. Lee has received and correlated clinical reports and studies on the use of yeast from physicians and hospitals in all parts of this country. He has discussed yeast for health with hundreds of our best doctors and personally supervised many of the tests. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Warrington. For the past four years, I have had the pleasure of passing on to you the results of the clinical work on you that has been under my direction. It is safe to say that the value of yeast has a broader foundation of scientific research than any other food product, with the possible exception of milk. In addition to its high vitamin value, Fleischmann's yeast finds its most important place in ridding the body of those poisons that injure your complexion lower your vitality, and are the direct cause of so many common ailments. Fleischmann's yeast has brought renewed health to many, and with health, happiness. Thank you. As spokesman tonight for the creators of modern American music, including the humbler citizens of Tin Pan Alley, as well as the boys who turn out jazz suites for Paul Whiteman concerts. We present the young man who wrote Rhapsody in Blue and I Got Rhythm. His most recent work, the score for Let It Be Take. His name, Mr. George Thurston. Thank you, Mr. Wallington. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You have heard the gentlemen from Carnegie Hall, Mr. Dean Taylor, the gentlemen from Times Square, Mr. Winslow, the gentlemen from Fitz Howard, Mr. Broom. I hereby make it a quartet, and if I had had a little more time, I should have been glad to compose a roundelay or Mad Begal for four voices and oboe in praise of Rudy Valley. Songwriters have excellent reasons for being fond of Mr. Valley. They are Valley fans for the same reason I am an ardent admirer of Al Jolson. My first hit tune, Swanee, gathered great quantities of discouraging dust on the publisher's shelves before Jolson took it, sang it at the Winter Garden, made it a hit. In the same way, Rudy has brought many an unknown to the attention of what Walter Winslow calls you and you and you. According to Hayward Broon, 
Rudy's greatest contribution to radio progress lies in his ability to pick plays, actors, and actresses. I disagree. Rudy is, first of all, a great song picker. He has picked a few of mine to my great delight and profit. For the delight and profit, Rudy, especially the profit, much thanks. Continuing Rudy's film review, a collection of his more recent numbers. The arrangement again by Elliot Sikoli. Thank 
sky the slope of very gentlemen, Rudy Valley. To the gentlemen who have said such kind things about me tonight, many thanks. To all our guest artists, great or less great, to Graham McNamee, who was with us for so long a time, to the songwriters and publishers who furnished me with the songs that have been my privilege to bring to you, and to all the Connecticut Yankees, again, many thanks. 
to my sponsors, whose script and production staff have worked in cooperation and have association with me during these four years. Many more things. And lastly, and most importantly, to those of you who have had the interest to continue to listen to us, may I express my deepest and most profound appreciation. This is the National Broadcasting Company. WEAF, New York.